What do you think initially it was about the British invasion that had such a sudden impact on America? Well, you've got to go back a little bit prior to the Beatles, I think, I mean, in, mm. in England, and, and look at what was happening in America, which was not a lot. I mean, Elvis had kind of faded out into the, into the services, into the army. Jerry Lee Lewis was busy murdering his third wife or whatever, and he kind of removed himself slightly from the rock and roll scene. Little Richard had probably got religion by that stage, and had kind of like slightly faded her way or two. Mm. Um, who, the other big, who was the other big one at that time? Well, anyway, the American kind of rock, early rock and roll thing with the, with the big, those big artists, like, and Buddy Holly had died, of course. Yeah. Um, I'd kind of like lost momentum uh, and they'd lost their, their uh, huge kind of like impact that they had when they first came on the scene in the mid 1950s. So there was kind of room for something to happen. Whenever it happens, something like that, a new kind of genre moves in, it happens not just with the music, but usually with something that is style, fashion. Uh, all those things were important. And it was beginning to happen in England and, and, and producing what they called the swinging 60s. The swinging 60s really only really happened in London, but everybody kind of makes out it happened all mm. over. I mean, it wasn't too swinging in Bradford or Sheffield or <laughs> Dungeness. Yeah. Yeah. But it was in London where they had the clubs and they had um, the Marquee Club and the Hundred Club and the uh, the speakeasy and the bag of nails and the flamingo, mm. the live music clubs, the flamingo, the bag of nails, and the hundred club were probably the, the most important. And they had gone through a period here in England too, where we'd had for a brief while a resurgence of trad jazz, with Dixieland, New Orleans, Chris Barber, Terry Lightfoot, Dick Charles with Monty Sunshine, uh, all those kind of uh, Ackerbilk. Mm -hmm. Kenny Ball, all those guys, um, had kind of given us a re-interest in uh, Dixieland, New Orleans style jazz. It wasn't real ethnic Dixieland, the uh, nearest we got to it was probably Ken Collier in that respect, mm -hmm. playing that kind of jazz which Louis Armstrong made famous. And that kind of got the kids interested for a while, and then those bands began to find the format rather restricted. And so did the people who were listening to it, you know. Mm. They began to realise they'd listened to the same solos over and over again. And in, out of that, they spawned Skiffle, which was do-it-yourself stuff. Mm. But very important, because it gave those people, those guys, the, the courage to pick up a guitar, play three chords and do some of their own songs. Yep. You know, Jeff Beck, B. Townsend, John Lennon... Um, uh, Keith Richards, all those guys were in little skiffle groups at some time mm. in their yeah. lives. Um, and then they too began to find that kind of was a bit boring after a while and repetitive. Mm. And so people, young people in this country were looking around for something different and they found rhythm and blues, mm. which originally of course came from I mean, the classic, the classic story is all the one about Mick Jagger and Keith Richard off on the right. railway station, you know. Yeah. Keith spots Mick with Records, Jimmy yeah. Reed, Muddy Waters, Bo Diddley uh, yeah. under his arm, and they're immediately bonded, you know. Mm. And I think the reason they, they looked for that was that the, the kids had got a bit... They'd seen through the, the kind of plasticity, the, the dishonesty of a lot of the pop music that was going down. You know, the guys that were writing it were not the people singing it in the most cases. Mm. So it wasn't so much an extension of what they believed or what they loved as what other people were going to write for them and they thought would actually make money at the box office or on a piece of plastic when they said when they sold it over the record shops, you know. Mm. And they found in blues music black guys singing about what really mattered to them and what really affected them, hurt them, 
mattered in their lives, or which mattered in most people's lives, which was um, mm. uh, sex yeah. for a star, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, work. work, and the pain of yeah. having had a, a life that had descended from slavery, and the cotton fields, and, and all the mm. hard work and mm. the pain that they had to go through, and they, they were writing about real things in songs, you know, about emotions that, that you could relate to that really mattered, that young people have just in the way that old people have, you know. Mm, mm. Um, very simple, basic things, but things that mattered and that they genuinely felt. And I think they picked that up swiftly in England. I mean, 1960, where would it be? I was on um, some teen papers at IPC. Mm. I wanted to be a sports writer, but the sports magazine folded and uh, they said you offered me the choice of sweeping the streets or writing disc columns for team painting. So I said, I'll write the disc columns, I'm really interested <laughs> in pop music, see if you're going to pay me. <laughs> and uh, I started writing disc columns for people like Cliff Richard and Adam Faith and Marty Wilde and mm. all those kind of imitation Elvis presents, I would call them at the time. I mean, we did think for a while that Cliff Richard was going to kind of do something, you know, when he had Move It, and it would kind of look like the real thing for about six weeks. Yeah. And then he did Living Dull, and we were like, ah, <laughs> right, <laughs> next. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so from there it kind of moved into this, you know, what are we, you know, what, what are we going to do next? What are we going to find next? And then the, the, the R&B scene began to open up with people like, well, Chris Barber's band which was still going as a trad band. It was kind of quite important in introducing R&B acts in the kind of like interval between, you know, set, just as he did with Skipple. Chris Barber was really important actually in developing popular music in this country because mm. uh, he gave people a chance, you know, to do mm. something else. He did it with Skipple and he did it with rhythm and blues. And a guy called Cyril Davis and Alexis Corner started doing the road, who played mm. at the 100 Club o Oxford Street. Mm. And a lot of the young guys that were looking for something new to, to do and to play went down there to listen and indeed to, to form their own bands as a result. I mean, people like Jagger and Stuart and... Uh, who else? Uh, Long John Baldry, um, mm. uh, man for man's whole crew really, and people Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart. They all went down there to kind of like jam and get little, yeah. little gigs without Alexis and play. And then they went away and formed their own bands. Is that Blues yeah. Incorporated? Yeah, the Blues Incorporated. Alexis that, called yeah. Blues Incorporated. A lot of people uh, played through that. Yeah, they did, they did, yeah. And John Mayle, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. also stayed pretty, pretty uh, dedicated to the original kind of blues, you know, not moving into something else. But it meant that there was a, cr a great kind of rhythm and blues boom. Mm. Not so much blues, but rhythm and blues boom. And because of that, some of the American, when the, the cover versions of those records by bands like The Animals and Manfred Man yep. and The Yardbirds started to appear in the charts. Then enterprising British agents said, you know, hey, you know, let's get these originals over, you know, from America. Let's get them, hmm. get them on the tour. And you can see the, how the original guys did it. You know, yeah. Muddy Waters is still alive. Bo Diddley is still alive. Uh, Let's get them into England, you know, and they did that tour that sh I showed you. That that's, so that's in about 1964. It was earlier than that. Earlier, much it started, so it's before it, the much early. I think yeah. it, I think they started coming in about 58. 58. You know, to begin with, uh, when it was, a, yeah. uh, but then later, more regularly. Yeah. And they played Europe, not just the UK. Yeah, I mean, that brings us on to um, what I was saying about uh, the theory that they took so much of American music and reintroduced it to America. Um, yeah, they did, yeah. They, and, and I think, as I said to you on the phone, the, the black guys were not altogether overwhelmingly yeah, grateful no. for <laughs> it. Because for a start, what was happening in America was that um, 
they were moving into gospel and they were moving into Tamla and, and soul and they'd left behind them old cotton fields at home, you know. And they moved on. Yeah, yeah, they were kind of like trying to, you know, that was kind of like almost Uncle Tom music to, to some of them, you know. They didn't want to be reminded of that period in history because it was a painful period. It was a period in which black musicians and black artists played for other black people. And they never got played, of course, on white radio in America because it was still mm. considered racist music, mm. you know, race music. And, not racist music, race music. Mm. And um, so, you know, it was kind of, that was a period that they were trying to move out of, the civil rights and trying to improve their own standard of living, etc. And were beginning to do so. So it didn't really want reminding of the good old bad days. Um, and people like <laughs> I, I, Eric Burden and the Animals, I mean, was a massive Nina Simone fan, for example. I mean, mm. Wonderfully talented artist. I don't know if you've ever heard any mm. classically mm. trained pianist, beautiful voice, sensational mm. artist, wrote great songs. And he was a, devoted to, to Nina Simone. And they did Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, which was a Nina Simone song. Nina Simone came to England. Uh, Chaz, Hilton, Eric and I, because that, then I'd moved on to the New Musical Express, I was working as a journalist there, so I knew the animals pretty well. Uh, they uh, went to see, uh, well, we went to see, Chaz, Hilton, Eric and I, went to see Nina Simone at the Finsbury Park Astoria. Mm. Uh, she was sensational. And we went backstage to see her. And uh, we were kind of like lurking in the corridor, waiting to get a, an audience and this guy came out and said Nina see you now but she just wants to see him <laughs> oh great you know he was what you know on the man you know she wants to see the singer you know so we were a bit pissed off <laughs> he went in and shut the door and all hell broke loose behind the door you white ugly bastard, you've stolen my song, you know? How dare you steal my song, you know? What do you think you're doing? Do you think I shall be grateful to you because you've stolen my song, you know? <laughs> Shit, it was, it was real. So she gave him a real verbal back. back and, too happy. and there was Love. something of that, you know, with, with some of these black brothers you've got to remember, you know? Mm. It was their song quite often. They'd written them, you know, and, yeah. you know, and they couldn't get hits with them themselves. And but yet. Manfred Mann, the animals, the yardbirds, yeah. and uh, all these other kind of English bands, the pretty things yeah. and whatever, they're not having hits with, with their songs. I think just to say, I mean, they should have got the royalties. I mean, sure. Hopefully they did, you know. Not, from, in what, case, not from what I've read. A lot well, of it, a lot of it, there you so go. You know, and that might be another reason they might have been able to But on the other hand, I mean, Nina calmed down, and Eric said he'd make absolutely sure she got every royalty that was due to yeah. her, and blah, 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 and it kind of all simmered down, she was fine, you know. But it was really funny to us, because we were standing on the other side of the door. That's a great story. She's <laughs> <laughs> pretty glad you didn't He's go in. He's roasting, thank God we're not in there. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, I've read about all the artists in America who were covering the rock and roll songs and they were putting their sort of clean you know marketable white face on it almost yeah there was a bit of whitewashing that went on it's yeah. what you were just mentioning um, a lot of people said that was happening in America before the British invasion with yeah. sort of cherry leaders people like Pat Boone and yeah I, well because the rock and roll thing so happy was a bit, bit kind of I mean Elvis they always said was a you know a, a white guy imitating a black guy when he sang, which I mm. kind of I never quite saw personally. I mean I never quite heard either. I, although there was elements, and he very soon kind of smoothed out from that that kind of approach. I mean you can hear it on Hound Dog. You can hear it perhaps on Mama Thought and, and the earlier stuff that mm. he recorded, which were black artists. Mm. But he didn't do an awful lot for black music, I don't think. No, 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 no. They didn't get too many roles. And I don't think he kind of ha looked to help them either. No. You know? I don't think he looked over his shoulder like yeah. Elvis when he got moving. So that was the difference I highlighted between 